On August 15, 1984, 72-year-old Abdo was biking along the shores of Lake Manoon, a bone-shaped crater lake in the country of Cameroon, when he came across a pickup truck parked on the side of the road. Inside the truck was the limp and lifeless body of a local priest. Abdo got back on his bike to look for help. Further down the road, he found another dead body, this one propped up on a motorcycle. A thoroughly freaked out Abdo dismounted and continued on foot. Around the bend, he encountered a flock of sheep lying sideways in the grass. Beyond that, more parked cars, all containing dead passengers. At first, the locals suspected that the mysterious murders at Lake Manu had been politically motivated, part of a ploy to overthrow the government. Suspecting another non-human culprit, the US Embassy in Cameroon's capital sent volcanologists to investigate the lake and its surroundings but they found no evidence of foul play, nor anything suggesting a volcanic eruption. There was no sulfur compounds in the lake, nor did they detect an increase in water temperature or a disturbance in the lake bed. They did, however, discover that the water at the bottom of the lake contained an extremely large amount of carbon dioxide. Suddenly, the pieces of the puzzle started falling into place. The local priest, the motorcyclist, the other drivers, and the sheep had all died by inhaling carbon dioxide released from the lake. Authorities were convinced that Mother Nature would not repeat this freak accident anytime soon, but that's exactly what would happen in August 21st, 1986, just a hundred kilometers away at Lake Nyos. Afram Chi was in his mud brick house, perched on a cliff overlooking the huge Lake Nyos and its surrounding villages. Where most of his family lived, it was just an ordinary evening until the tranquility was shattered by an ominous rumbling reminiscent of a distant rock slide. Then a strange white mist began to rise from the lake's surface. Chi didn't think much of it at the time, and even told his children that it looked as if rain were on the way, then went to bed as he was feeling quite unwell. With the first light of dawn, Chi awoke and ventured downhill towards Lake Nyos, only to be met with a discerning sight. The once crystal blue waters of the lake had turned a dull red. As he approached the lake's outlet, he noticed an unsettling silence, a complete absence of the usual symphony of nature's sounds. No birds, no insects, just an eerily quietness. Starting to feel very uneasy, Chi started running towards the village. Before reaching the village, he was met by the cries of a woman, Sole, driven to despair by the horrifying scene before her. Scattered around her were the bodies of her four children, as she frantically attempted to wake up her lifeless father. Chi couldn't believe what he was seeing. With his heart now pounding, Chi continued racing downhill to the village to find his family, hoping that they are okay. Upon entering the village, his heart dropped as he was met with countless lifeless bodies. He found his family's house, but they also had met the same fate. Chi fell to his knees, crying, thinking that this must be the end of the world. And it would be the end for some 1,800 people who would perish at Lake Nyos. Many of the victims were found right where they'd normally be around 9 o'clock at night, suggesting they died on the spot. Bodies lay near cooking fires, clustered in doorways, and some in bed. Some people who had lain unconscious for more than a day finally awoke to see their family members lying dead, and then committed suicide. Rescuers would arrive at the village around Lake Nyos at 6.30am. They were met with a misty cloud which did not disperse until four hours later. Some of the bodies of the victims were covered in horrible burns. Most of the native population were farmers and cattle raisers. Many cattle as well as other animals were killed. Survivors near the lake recalled hearing wind or animals being disturbed, and some reported a smell of gunpowder or rotten eggs before suddenly losing consciousness. In the days and weeks that followed, scientists meticulously studied the phenomenon, trying to unravel the enigmatic forces that had unleashed such unimaginable destruction upon the unsuspecting communities surrounding Lake Nyos. Six months later, scientists found carbon dioxide with a small amount of methane still bubbling from deep water samples, and so they concluded that carbon dioxide had been the lethal gas. Nyos, just like Lake Monaun, rests on a crater of rubble formed by previous volcanic eruptions. The lake's carbon dioxide either comes directly from this rubble or from magma further below. Due to a combination of current, pressure, and climate, the carbon dioxide cannot escape, causing it to accumulate at the bottom of the lake. 
turning Lake Nios into a giant, deadly soda bottle, one that is shaken for centuries without ever taking off the cap. But when this cap was, at last, removed, possibly one billion cubic yards of carbon dioxide climbed into the air and into the surrounding area. Though the gas is believed to have been volcanic, its precise composition and mechanism of release remain uncertain. Volcanic gases typically contain water vapour, carbon dioxide, sulphur dioxide, hydrogen sulphide, hydrogen chloride, hydrogen fluoride, and carbon monoxide. Carbon dioxide, however, was the only gas detected in samples of the lake water, suggesting that this was the predominant if not the only gas released. But the strange lesions and wounds found on the victims leaves one to wonder what other compounds other than carbon dioxide were present in the gas. While the Lake Nios disaster had a devastating impact at the time of the event, efforts have been made over the years to support the affected communities and aid in their recovery. After the devastating event at Lake Nios, recognising the urgent threat posed by the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the lake, Various organisations and government agencies came together to implement effective measures to prevent future disasters. Teams of engineers, scientists and workers embarked on a monumental task of installing degassing pipes at the bottom of Lake Nios. The degassing pipes are vertical structures that extend from the bottom of Lake Nios to the surface. These pipes are designed to allow the release of the carbon dioxide trapped at the bottom of the lake so at least the villagers of Lake Nios can now rest easy knowing that this will never happen again. <laughs>